Hello. Today I would like to talk to you about the Korean lies. Look here. Comfort women were paid prostitutes. They were paid about 100 yen each time for their services, which was quite a lot back then in World War II. This is an official US report, by the way, on the comfort woman. Also, among other claims, is the forced labour by Japanese soldiers. This is not the case. The labour was not forced and they were paid. There are some photos that were submitted to the UN. You guys have enjoyed my series looking at booze. I'm not talking about the Mario ghost. I'm talking about weeaboos. I'm talking about veraboos. I'm talking about weeaboos from South Africa. And I asked people what they want to see next. And roadie booze was a big one. So people who simp for Rhodesia, that dead country, which we'll get on to another time. But today we're going to do tojo booze. Now, you guys might ask, what is the difference between a tojo boo or a weeaboo or an otaku or something like that? I think the difference is with tojo boos is they very specifically focus on the World War II aspect of Japan and the colonial wars they fought leading up to World War II. Whereas weeaboos often do push revisionist history about Japan's involvement in World War II, they're not completely focused on it. So today what we're going to do is look at various Tojo Boo myths. I actually found a Tojo Boo YouTube channel by a guy who is a Tojo Boo, so we're going to look at that as well. And basically we're going to look at this revisionist history pushed about the Japanese involvement in the war. Things like, you know, characterise it as the Americans started it or, you know, they didn't commit atrocities and comfort women were paid fairly and... They didn't kill loads of people, basically all that sort of stuff. But before we go any further, edgier content on my channel is always demonetized. So if you want to support me monetarily, please check out my Patreon. Thanks so much to everyone who has already done this. At the moment, the benefits are gaining access to the private Discord server. And you obviously have your name featured at the end of every video and in the description. I'm working for some other benefits that will come in the future. If you want to join our growing community, please check out the Discord and the subreddit in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, check out at the Cavernacle on Instagram and Twitter. And also you slash Tommy Cahill 1995 for my personal Reddit. So with that out the way, let's get into the video. Also this week we hit 25k. So look, we now have five chocolate oranges. If you want to see the chocolate orange pyramid go even higher, subscribe, like the video, support the channel. And hopefully one day there's going to be a big live stream of me eating so many for like 100k. And I'll be really sick. It'll be thousands and thousands of calories. But it's worth it if you help me get to 100k one day. So I've made multiple videos on Japan. People in Japan who are on the far right and push revisionist history. People in the West, in the alt-right, who love Japan and love their previous militarism. Japan itself has a massive problem with revisionist history towards its involvement in World War II and both Sino-Japanese wars, including the current government, including the history books that don't tell the real story of things like the rape of Nanking. And although Japan are somewhat allies of countries like South Korea, there is still a lot of hostility because Japan annexed Korea in 1910 and owned it until the end of the war. And then you have things like comfort women and working people to death in awful conditions. Just after the mid-1800s, Japan wanted to be like a Western military power in Asia. So it copied a lot of the models of different countries like Britain and Prussia and started its conquests around Asia. And although at various times it allied with, you know, allies in World War I and it helped them fight in the Russian Civil War and stuff, it slowly started taking more and more territory across Asia for itself. So I said both Sino-Japanese wars where they committed various war crimes while fighting the Chinese over different territory in the region. So it's a good way to think about the Japanese empire is that it was like a Western colonial power, but it had the ideology of a fascist power as well with its you know racial supremacy and its military dictatorship and stuff. So that is something to keep in mind while we go through Tojo Bu myths I guess the main difference is that a lot of Tojo boos 
didn't actually grow up in Japan, so there's not really an excuse for accepting this revisionist history because you're not being taught it. And although I think there's a discussion to be had about characterizing the war between Japan and America as more of a colonial war rather than some sort of ideological clash, I don't think that is completely relevant to this video because a lot of this is just apologetic to the awful stuff Japan did. Rather than some sort of an attempt to reframe, I guess, the conflict between the West and Japan during World War II. So just to sort of frame the Tojo Buu's mind, there was a film in Japan that was pushing this sort of Tojo Buu ideology. So from 2008, the Irish Times reporting, The Truth of Nanking gives a new slant on Japan's war history. Japan was the victim, not the aggressor in the Second World War. Its worst war crimes were all lies cooked up by the enemy, and its leaders were Christ-like figures who died to save the nation from ruin. This Alice in Wonderland version of history has made it into the big screen with The Truth of Nanking, a low-budget film about the 1937 8 rape of the old Chinese capital by the Japanese army is being screened with English subtitles in LA on its way to Europe. Part of a planned revisionist trilogy, the movie opens with a dedication to the seven honourable martyrs who sacrificed themselves to the fatherland. It's just overtly fascist. Their bravery, love and pain vanished like gallows of dew, says the puzzling English brochure accompanying the movie's release. Nanking is not the first filmic attempt to overturn accepted wisdom about Japan's role in the war. Pride, a biopic of Hideki Tojo, who, you know, Tojo Boo is named after, showing him in a broadly sympathetic light caused predictable outrage in China and Korea when it was released 10 years ago. Unlike Pride, however, which was a major success, Nanking has not bothered box office records. I was one of the handful of journalists who bothered to turn up to the screening. Oh yeah, maybe I should have made that clear. Of course, Tojo Boo is referencing Hideki Tojo, who was the Prime Minister of Japan during the war and had served in various positions in the military throughout his career, which dated back to the First Sino-Japanese War. So I said I found a Tojo Boo in the wild. Now, He's such a Tojo Boo and a Weeaboo that everything on his channel is also subtitled in Japanese and his name is actually in Japanese and he writes the descriptions in Japanese. So I don't know what this guy's name is. But here is a video about anti-Japanese lies where he talks about the Japanese occupation of Korea. Hello. Today I would like to talk to you about the Korean lies. Look here. Comfort women were paid prostitutes. They were paid about 100 yen each time for their services, which was quite a lot back then in World War II. This is an official US report, by the way, on the comfort woman. Also, among other claims, is the forced labor by Japanese soldiers. This is not the case. The labor was not forced and they were paid. There are some photos that were submitted to the UN that were supposed to be proof of forced labor. But here is the Japanese workers. Another claim is that forced workers were treated poorly. But no, again, they were paid and they stayed in good hotel-like facilities had access to lots of different things they could do, for example, onsen. And here is their salary. They were paid workers. There is no disputing this fact. I get very angry when Korea tries to make lies about Japan. All you need to do is search Google and you can find proof that Japan didn't force Koreans to work, they chose to work. And as for comfort women being paid, even today the Korean government encourages comfort women for the US soldiers and alongside military bases you can find brothels. So he also has the rising sun flag in the back, which is, of course, a symbol of Japanese fascism during the war. And I don't really need to go into too much detail how this is just revisionist history. I mean, African slaves in America were sometimes paid. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't really prove anything. And of course, this is a very sensitive issue to Korea. And Japan was known to do this stuff a lot. Of course, there was always a lot of brothels in wartime and poverty places. But comfort women specifically and how the Japanese treated women as this like commodity 
and just there for their pleasure and stuff. This is a real thing. And just because he has some documents that show certain comfort women and prostitutes were paid by the Japanese soldiers, which I'm sure probably happened sometimes, does not mean this isn't a real issue that happened. And and there's a reason it's still so outrageous in Korea. There's a reason, despite being Western-aligned allies, this is still a massive problem between the two countries and something they can't get over. There is so much testimony from Koreans who lived under you know, Japanese occupation for about 35 years, testifying to these atrocities, to the exploitation of women. And he also goes on to talk about the people working there. There is so much literature and so much testimony about how the Japanese colonial forces treated people in Korea, Manchuria, in China, where they would work these people to death many times. Shinzo Abe's granddad, who became prime minister, was actually charged for doing this in Manchuria. And he was actually charged because he brought a lot of Manchurians back to Japan and worked them to death for the war effort. Just because some may have been paid and it wasn't outright slavery doesn't mean this wasn't a brutal thing. It's like me talking about, you know, Chinese slavery in South Africa. The British did. I'm sure some of these Chinese people were paid. They were also kept in camps and treated like absolute garbage and they couldn't leave. It's pretty similar to how the Japanese treated these people. So moving on to Tojo Bu YouTuber's second video. So in this one, he talks about um, the Battle of Peleliu, uh, which is a famous battle, and it's in TV shows like The Pacific, which is very good by HBO. So you can go check that out, and it's in video games like Call of Duty World War II. Basically, he talks about the Japanese not letting the natives fight with them. The local commander who took command was Colonel Kunio Nakagawa. The commander of the 2nd Infantry Regiment, led a garrison of about 10,500 soldiers. The residents of Peleliu offered to fight alongside the Japanese, but Colonel Nakagawa uttered a harsh rebuke to the residents. The Japanese Imperial Army will not lower itself to fight alongside the savages like you. The residents were so upset because they thought not only were the Japanese soldiers their friends, but also their comrades. They felt betrayed by Colonel Nakagawa and they decided to leave the island. A few days after, all the residents got on board a ship organised by the Japanese army to evacuate them to the main island. The evacuation ship was leaving the pier. While leaving, the residents were looking back at their home island, being filled with sadness. All of a sudden, they heard someone yelling on the pier. It was the Japanese soldiers that had been hiding until now, and they were waving to the residents. The soldiers waved their hands and yelled to the residents, Live well! See you again! Among the soldiers, they saw Colonel Nakagawa with a big smile. Then the residents understand that Nakagawa acted very rudely to make the residents want to evacuate. The residents learned later the reason for Colonel Nakagawa's words and true intentions to save them and they shed tears. On April 22nd, 1947, about two years after the end of the war, Pacific Fleet Commander-in-Chief C.W. Nimitz praised the Japanese fighting spirit with the following words. Tourists from every country that visit this island should be told how courageous and patriotic were the Japanese soldiers who all died defending this island. I also find it very ironic that he paints this as a good thing that this general was so like honourable and everything that he saved the natives even though he said he wouldn't fight them because they're savages. And of course, I'm inclined to believe the general at his word since most Japanese were racial supremacists at this time, especially in the military, believing they were this master race and stuff. And when you have natives in these Pacific islands, who they also committed atrocities towards, like the people in Okinawa is the more famous one, then of course I take him at his word and, and don't think it was a secret plan to save these people. But also throughout the video, he talks about how honourable the Japanese are and how good fighters they are. So this guy is clearly idolising these Japanese. The only thing I would say is that of course, the Japanese were total fanatics. I don't know if that's an admirable quality. But the only thing I can't understand, as soldiers and as, like, humans, you can kind of be like, I can't believe they were so fanatical to just be so suicidal. I know it's part of their warrior code, you know, seppuku and stuff as well, and kamikaze. 
But to be this fanatical and suicidal, I guess, is kind of, for a lot of people, admirable. And he says the US would talk about their bravery and courage. But there's also a lot of SS that were like that in the Nazi army. So I wouldn't really idolise this because it's so destructive. It's not like they're dying for a good cause and they won't surrender and stuff. They're literally you know, dying and killing for Japanese imperialism and fascism. So I've proud the internet for Tojo booze on places like Reddit and stuff. So let's read some more myths about, you know, how America's fought the war started and everything like that. And the Japanese were pretty good and they didn't commit many war crimes. So um, one person says, Hosen Kai on Reddit, quoting something that says, Japan systemically commits atrocities and war crimes in Asia on par with the Nazis' conduct in the Holocaust. And general plan and he says that's completely untrue japan never developed or carried any plan of extermination of certain populations in a whole or in parts japanese soldiers killed a lot of people no doubt about it but they did so in incidents indiscriminate violence not authorized by the japanese government like i said shinzo abe's granddad was this butcher in manchuria who worked these people to death if that's not some sort of genocide where you just don't give a shit about these people and will use them as slave labor and then you have, you know, the rape of Nanking and you have all this racial supremacy where they would kill natives and stuff and kill various Asian peoples like Filipinos, Vietnamese, Koreans and Manchurians and stuff. Then, yeah, of course they did. Maybe you could argue with the Holocaust point in terms of that, like, that the Holocaust was quite unique. That it was this mechanical culling of a very, very specific type of racial group which the Germans deemed as the root of all their problems. Of course, many other people were also killed in the Holocaust, but I'm mainly focused on the Jewish angle, which is the main part of it. So maybe you could argue that the Japanese didn't have a broader system like that, but at the same time, you don't have to then go and talk about how they didn't exterminate certain populations, they didn't have an ideology of racial supremacy, they didn't do mass killings because of this ideology, because that's simply not true. They did do these things. So someone else saying, t Pone Ranger, Japan wasn't a country that existed simply because of racism. Japan wasn't a country that promoted a racist agenda and committed genocide. Nazi Germany was. That is why those flags are associated with hate and the Imperial Japanese flag is not. The Imperial Japanese flag is. And again, completely wrong. The Japanese ideology of the time did promote a racist agenda and did lead to things like genocide. Now, on a post talking about the Empire of Japan killed as many as 200,000 Chinese civilians because they helped... 67 American bomber crewmen escape the Japanese. Some guy talks about the justification for the war on the Japanese side, basically blaming it on the racism of the colonial powers uh, in World War One, which is like a complete separate issue from Japanese militarism in, you know, between the late 1800s to 1945. So someone says, I was watching World War II in colour last night, which is actually a really good documentary, uh, the second one, uh, the newer one. And I never known why the Japanese attacked the US. It turns out that they helped the British in Asia during World War One, and they tried to negotiate with Western powers after the war to allow Japanese people to immigrate to Western countries. They were shot down by everyone, and then the American president instituted a whites-only legal immigration plan. I imagine the royal that royally pissed off the Japanese, and when the Americans moved their enormous naval fleet to Pearl Harbor, the Japanese feared they were the next ones to be conquered as they looked around the Pacific to see the Dutch, French, British, and American imperialists had full control over vast swathes of land they acquired through the conquest. So he's basically saying the reason the Japanese attacked America was because they were very, very fearful for their own security, and because the League of Nations was racist, which it was towards Asian people and non-white people, which it was that they were justified in doing Pearl Harbor. Of course, I don't need to mention to you that after World War One, America didn't have much of an appetite for war. It was slightly more isolationist, although I think it's a myth that it was totally isolationist, as some people like to say. But if you read anything about this period of history and since the mid-1800s, Japan wanted its Western-style empire in Asia. Japan decided to copy certain European empires and after the first Sino-Japanese war, it controlled a lot of territory and it only wanted to control more and more. You can literally chart a progression through this period of Japan fighting more and more wars for more territory. Just like the Europeans and the Americans, it was an empire. And, you know, there's stuff like the oil embargo that the Americans put on them but that wasn't really going to stop their trajectory. And because America is an active player in Asia, you know, things like the Philippines and everything was always a target for Japan. It's just a rivalry that was eventually going to butt heads. It didn't come out of some sort of, you know, 
Japanese grievance with America, not liking them racially or not accepting them as much during, you know, World War One and the League of Nations. It was because of Japanese imperialism that they attacked the Americans. Of course, oil did have something to do with it, but nothing like what this guy is saying about these guys feeling very scared of America. So there was an article in the National Interest that was called Five Ways Japan Could Have Won World War Two," And I'm not really going to go through the article because it's very long and I might, mainly don't have the whole knowledge to debunk everything they're saying. But I want to focus on the comments that someone kindly posted on Reddit. So they're called Tamo Corsai. So the comments are worse than the article. Someone said, Japan lost because they were too honourable. Unrestricted submarine warfare was considered dishonourable. And in fact, at Nuremberg, the British tried to prosecute the Admiral Canaris for it, but had to back off as the Americans had done the same in the Pacific. Someone saying, honourable, the victims of Nanking and countless other places would like a word with you. The reality is that Jap Japan was more focused on using their submarines for fleet combat due to the doctrine, not honour. Someone else saying, also Japan had no choice but to fight the US as the US had blocked them from steel and oil and the war in China would be lost without steel and oil. The oil was in there, was in Indonesia, but the Philippines was in the way. So Japan had to attack the US or accept defeat to China. It, that's like a weird comment, like playing into like Japan being a victim because it didn't have enough resources to commit a brutal 